I was raised as a very devout Muslim in the United States. And the fact of the matter was, every time I connected with the Christian, I realized that they didn't know why they believed what they believed. The Christians who were around me wouldn't share the gospel with me, and I never realized why. I concluded either they didn't believe the gospel was true, or if they did believe it, they didn't care if I went to hell. It is a pain to know that there are people who do not know Jesus. It is a greater pain to know that oftentimes Jesus and Christianity is being distorted. Who told you you can't accomplish your dreams? I think around the world, they know the phrase, the American dream. Your destiny is calling out. It's time to start living large. We are exporting the very worst of what Christianity has to offer. I declare you debt free today, saith God. So that many people harden their heart against a Jesus, a Christ, a Christianity, that is not the true version of it. It's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. I live in Texas. We are considered the buckle on the Bible belt. Around here, everybody thinks they're Christian simply because they live in a conservative region of the nation. You can grow up in the church, hear a gospel about freedom, and still work your tail off trying to maintain the image that you're a good person. I had my Jesus on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights at youth group, and the rest of the week I was chasing after worldly things that made me happy. And I saw nothing to like about God. You have an increasing number of people that were raised in churches that didn't take the gospel seriously or took it for granted. Wow, like Jesus died for my sins? That's so convenient for me. I don't have to go to hell, but I'm going to go do my own thing. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, they don't know what they believe or why they believe it. We're assuming that people understand the gospel. I think it was Christian Smith who said that what we're seeing nowadays in the American church is the rise of what he calls moralistic, therapeutic, deism, how to make people moral. You know, I look like this perfect golden child, but I was so dead. A place to go to feel better about themselves. I'm asking you to feel good about who you are. And so as a result, we're seeing a church in America that's becoming ultimately Christless. So if we're following the gospel thinking it's all about us, we've missed Jesus' words entirely. The fact that we were raised Christian doesn't make us a Christian. We have to have a supernatural rebirth. I went from somebody who hated Jesus to a guy that loved Jesus and spent all his time at church. Why? When you come in contact with him, you change. Like there's nothing that I could have done to make this happen. Like he literally gave me a new heart. And when the heart changes, everything changes. If this is true, this story is so captivating. All I knew was that I had severely overlooked something. I opened that word and nothing was ever the same. There was a time in my life that I thought the goal of preaching was to get people to do what they don't want to do. Which, which, by the way, is a terrible profession. You know, that my goal is to somehow arm twist or browbeat people into doing what they don't want to do. I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. One of the biggest turning points for me happened while I was a youth pastor at a church. And it's kind of a sad thing to look back, like I'm a pastor, I'm teaching the Bible, but I didn't know what it meant to teach the gospel in the Bible because I wasn't really telling people the good news about Jesus. I was telling them to be a passionate, zealous, committed, radical Christian. I was very passionate. In a lot of ways, my church put emphasis on things that scripture didn't put emphasis on. I don't think Jesus was the center or the gospel was the center. It was more so what we do, what we can do. And so as a new believer, I never really knew that the gospel was a big deal. And I was realizing how Christless preaching was. And I, I can remember a sermon from the Sermon on the Mount, and it was 10 tips on how to be sexually pure. And I remember that day, like that being a turning point in my journey to say, I never want to be a pastor or preacher like that. <laughs> like, what are you doing to earn God's favor? Have you tithed enough? Have you given enough? Have you prayed long enough? Have you 
laid hands on anybody in the last week? Have you spoken tongues? If not, then you're not a believer. In fact, I think the thing most common among unbelievers when they think about Christianity is they think about Christian moralism. What we believe about sex, what we believe about money, what we believe about them. The most common misperception about what Christianity is, is it some sort of moral betterment program. And it is about being good. And that's what all religions are about anyway. Be a good person. There's few things as damning and devastating to the human spirit than, than that message. We want to first of all say there's nothing wrong with preaching morality. We certainly don't want to preach the opposite, immorality. But moralistic preaching, or sometimes identified as moralism, is preaching the commands of Scripture or the morals of Scripture and nothing else. Just pretty much saying to people, you be a good person and God will love you for that. And while we do not intend it, that is not just a sub-Christian message, it's actually an anti-Christian message. I was hearing from the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, here's how not to be sexually immoral. But then I'm thinking about the passage in the Sermon on the Mount and the whole point is to try and tell us you're not sexually moral. Your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees and you think that it's about keeping these lists of rules and the Ten Commandments. Well, I say to you, and I, he, he takes it to the heart and he says, if you have lust in your heart, then you're falling way short. And he, he concludes that section in Matthew 5 by saying, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But that's not the sermon that was preached. It was, you can be pure, you can be sexually uh, moral, and here's your 10 tips. You're giving them a goal that they'll never be able to attain, period. The messages that just say be good damn people to their pride or to despair. There are really only two possible human responses. One response to a be good message is, been there, done that, checked off that box. The person will believe they can attain it, be the Pharisee, um, and work and work and work and work, or be the Mormon, <laughs> work and work, or the Muslim or the Jehovah's Witness, all of them. <laughs> you'll, you'll try to earn salvation by trying to be a good person. Why do I have to, you know, repent? Why do I have to ask for forgiveness if you're not making mistakes? I work hard, I'm an honorable person. Jesus is walking down the road uh, one day and a young man comes up to him and says, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it sounds like a very safe question. It's actually a landmine. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It, already it's about performance. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, Jesus responds with great wisdom. He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And then he says, you know the commandments. But Joy, then what, but what is the standard of goodness? Be good that, to your neighbor, don't cheat okay, on your but husband, but, don't steal. But in the, don't lie, don't steal. Gives them the list of the commands. But in the Bible, God's standard is the Ten Commandments. I'm good on that too. And the young man immediately says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus just said, only God is good. And two seconds later, what does the young man say? Me too! In which case he gives himself the status and the stature of God. It's just pure pride. And by the way, breaks the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods. You've never told a lie before, ever? Oh, what, is that one of the commandments? It's the commandment. Uh, never mind. Nine. Jesus is like, okay, sell everything you have. Dude walks away. So you're not good, <laughs> you can't be good. And Jesus already lays out the foundation that only God is good because he defines what goodness truly is. I try and lead a life where I don't have to ask God for forgiveness. If you have a proud heart, and most people are very proud of heart, and the way to find that out is just say, do you think you're a good person? All in all, I'm a good person. I don't, I don't really lie, cheat, or steal, so. You don't lie? You know what, never mind. I'll take that back. I don't. I don't tell huge lies, I tell white lies. I believe I'm a good person, how about you? You do? Yeah. How many lies have you told in your whole life? Um, I can't count them. <laughs> you ever stolen something? Stolen something before? Yes, I have. I think the misunderstanding is that God's law was given as a standard for us to live by. Well, try and live by it. Well, the law's a mirror. 
It's just simply meant to reflect what God thinks, who God is, how He wants you to live. And then you get to look in the mirror and you get to go, how do I fit that standard? You know, love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, because that's the essence of the law. We can't do it. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Accidentally, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get rid of that. So you've done it? Yes. It's called blasphemy, it's very serious. Uh, I've never known anybody in my whole life that has looked in a mirror and said, I have something in my teeth, and then taken the mirror off the wall and tried to pick their teeth with it. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever done that? Yes. I'm not going to lie, I did. And you don't take the law and then try to fix yourself with it. You take the law and say, I'm in need of help because something is wrong. If we don't understand who God is, then the gospel does not make much sense. You see, the great issue here is that God is holy and God is just, and that man is unholy. And man is not just, man is unrighteous, man is a sinner. So Eduardo, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterate heart. And that's only four of the Ten Commandments. We can look at others and go, well, I'm not as bad as them, and I didn't do all of that, but so I'm not that bad. But that's a lie. You're bad compared to Christ, who is altogether lovely, who is holy. We pale in comparison, so a person needs to really take a good look at Jesus, and then you know who you are. My problem of sin goes far beyond my actions. It goes to who I am as a person. I have a nature of sin. That is my essence. Uh, the human heart is predisposed right now to love everything else besides God, uh, to love self more than God, to love wrong more than right. The heart is totally opposed to God, conceived in iniquity, born in sin. 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. They may make poor choices, but deep down, they've got a good heart. You and I are naturally rebels to God. So how do you fix the broken part of the human heart that loves the wrong things? The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 verse 1 immediately comes to mind. To be dead in sin means that we are physically alive, but that we are morally unable to respond to God. What can a dead man do? And the gospel not only addresses my behavior, my actions, it addresses who I am by promising to change me at the core basic level of personhood. Therefore, God must perform a resurrection. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, are you going to be innocent or guilty? By the guidelines, I'm going to be guilty. Heaven or hell? I'm assuming hell. In that case, everyone will be a bad person? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. It says there's none good because good in God's book means morally perfect. So if all we say to people is be good, the other human response is, wait, what does it mean to be good? Does it mean to be as holy as God is holy? Never lie? Never be selfish? Never in any way do things that are contrary to God's law? Oh my, I'm, I'm in despair now. What you're doing is you're revealing in the hearts of your people their shortcomings and failures. So to just leave it in their hands and their effort puts a weight on them they can't bear up under. I felt like I was walking on eggshells all the time because it felt as if at any moment I can go to hell because I'm not doing enough. Um, and that's where you see a lot of people who grew up in churches where the gospel might not have been really fleshed out, where they become atheists because it's like, I can't do enough to please him anyway, so why, why trust him? Why believe in him? Um, I'm still the same person. I'm still wicked. I'm still sinful. Well, what if I have failed sexually? If I'm a, a man sitting in the church service at that moment, I have no hope as I walk out. I'm just told, here's 10 ways that you should try harder. We're damning people to those twin possibilities of pride on the one hand or despair on the other. And this is why the gospel is so important, because the gospel comes in in the middle of both of those and says, yeah, you're right. You aren't good enough on the one hand, but Jesus was good for you. How can sinful man be reconciled to a just God whose justice demands that they be punished. 
Do you know what God did for guilty sinners so he wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? The answer is found in the person of Jesus Christ, the historical person, God intervening into human history. And this Jesus of Nazareth lived the perfect life that you and I could never live, have never lived. And then he goes to a cross. We owed a debt to God because of our sin. And that debt was suffering eternal punishment. But on the cross, God himself, he took our place, bore our sin, and suffered the wrath of God that we deserve. He extinguished it. He put it away. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Then he ascended up into heaven. And this Jesus, the Son of God, sat down at the right hand of God. And now the Bible teaches that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except through Him, that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if you repent and trust alone in Jesus as your Savior, God will remit your sins, dismiss your case, and grant you the everlasting life as a gift, not because you're good, but because He's rich in mercy. In many ways, the defining doctrine of true biblical Christianity is justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Justification is God declaring us righteous even though we are guilty of sin. We see in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works so that no man may boast. And so this is the great dividing line between biblical Christianity during the Reformation and the Roman Catholic religion. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church on justification is that they believe that you are justified by faith plus works. In fact, at the Council of Trent, which people refer to as the Counter-Reformation, they actually issued an anathema. If anybody believes that they are justified by faith alone, they are condemned under the anathema of the Council of Trent. And so the Roman Catholic Church actively was opposing and cursing those who were holding a biblical gospel. It is often called the plus religion because Catholicism teaches that you are saved by faith plus works, by grace plus merit, by Christ plus other mediators, according to scripture plus tradition, and for the glory of God as well as the glory of Mary and other saints. When you look at the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, it is a salvation of works and sacraments. In the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, baptism cleanses an infant from original sin. And that is the sacrament of regeneration as well as justification. That it starts them off on this plan, on this track. Along the way, however, they can commit these small sins, venial sins, which plunges them back down. And heaven forbid they commit a mortal sin, which knocks them completely off the plan of salvation. And he must now receive sacraments. He must confess his sins to a priest, which is the sacrament of penance. And then he must be re-justified by doing good works, by doing penance. And once he is re-justified, then he must maintain his salvation through sacraments. And if, in the end, if they have enough people praying for them, and if they do enough time in purgatory, they might possibly get to heaven. How they get to heaven is based on what they do rather than what Christ has done. But the Bible teaches there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the work has been done. He saves you totally, completely, perfectly. And even though, yes, we sin and can repent, the sacrifice of Christ has paid for those sins. And so there is assurance that he has saved you, he has plucked you out of the world, you're in the palm of his hand, and nobody can pluck you out of his hand. And so that's why the reformers cried the five solas, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. That message has always found opposition. And the Jerusalem Council, and we read about it in the book of Acts, actually addressed this very same issue. The rabbis and the Judaizers were saying to the Christians that God will accept you by his grace through faith 
and your keeping of the ceremonial laws, being circumcised, washing your hands, keeping the food laws. And the entire church agreed, as summarized by uh, the Apostle Peter's statement, that that is not the good news. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't come to make salvation possible for those who do their part. He came to accomplish it and to give it freely to all of his people. The question is, well, how do we know if faith is real if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit, that your faith alone in Jesus, that is what saves. And then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart produces fruit the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God, by grace, through faith in Christ. You see, the Christian is the only person, the true Christian, who can say that they're going to heaven without being self-righteous. Why? In other religions, how do you get to heaven? You get to heaven by being good, by earning it. In Christianity, you're not reconciled to God through your own virtue or merit, but you're reconciled to God through the virtue and merit of His Son. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. So, Gusto, if you were to die today, how old are you? 19. If you were to die at 19 and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent and trust in Christ. When are you going to do that? Almost immediately. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Euangelion, the Greek word gospel, is taken from the good news that a runner would bring as a messenger coming to announce in the capital that victory had been achieved on the battlefield. And everyone would cheer. It would transform the lives of everybody in the city to know that they hadn't lost the war, they had won the war. But of course, they weren't the ones out there in, in, in the trenches. In the same way, Jesus says, I have accomplished salvation, not come help me save the world, but I have accomplished this. The law basically is do. The gospel basically is done. The gospel isn't what would Jesus do, now go and do that. The gospel is what has Jesus done, now believe that. This distinction between the law and the gospel really is the most important thing to remember and it's one of the things that we're forgetting. That pattern of God always making sure that we know that relationship comes before obedience, that we do not have a relationship with Him because we obey, we obey because He has made a relationship with us. That is made clear over and over again in the Bible. God says before He ever tells His people what the commands are, I'm the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, now obey me. Now, it's critical we understand he didn't say, you obey me and I'll let you out of Egypt. No, he said, I have redeemed you. Now here's the safe path for you to walk on. It's the order not just of the Old Testament passages. I mean, all the epistles of the New Testament basically follow that same order. In general, the first half of the epistles of Paul, of John, of Peter kind of say, here's what God has done in Christ. Here's how he has saved you. The last half of the epistles, now here's what you should do in response. The moral commands that we should obey are like the railroad tracks for the train, that as the train's going, this is the way that the train's supposed to go. But the gospel is the engine and the fuel that makes the train actually move. And so it does a Christian no good and it does a non-Christian no good to just continue telling them, hey, here's the tracks, now go. But if they have no fuel, if they have no engine, they're just gonna be a train stuck. And there's a lot of Christians, I think, today that are just trains sitting on tracks, being told, go forward, but they're not being given an engine or any fuel to move them forward. There are some pastors out there that assume, I think incorrectly, but understandably, that everyone in their church understands the gospel. 
I remember years ago, I was asked to address a group, a large group, but they told me that they were mainly Christians. And they said, well, what are you going to preach on? And I said, well, I thought about preaching on the gospel. And they said, but we just told you that these, most of these people, we know them as very devout and sincere Christians. And I said, well, first of all, I appreciate that, but I can never assume that everyone there is truly Christian or has come to a biblical understanding of the gospel. That's number one. Number two, the gospel is not just for lost people. The gospel is for Christians. God being three in one, eternally existing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, in His great love, he, he made creation to share His love with. Um, not that He needed to, but He wanted to. And in that, He created us. And in creating us, we fell into sin. And sin is something that separates us from God. It's something that is not of God. It's something that's against God. On Saturday nights during the um, summer, we host worship nights at our house, usually starting at about 6.30. You know, we'll play basketball, we'll throw the football frisbee around, and we'll just talk and hang out outside. Um, and then we'll gather in the living room, and there'll be a time of worship. In our community, we've made it a practice that every week we try to have meetings where the, the gospel is at least presented one time. And Jesus being fully man, fully God, walked on this earth and lived a life without sin, without blemish, um, and lived the life that we were called to live and lived the life that we should have lived. And in our place, he died the death that we deserve. Three days later, he rose again after that death on the cross. And one of the things we do stress is that even believers need it, even people that hear it a hundred times a month still need that. We do have hope because any kind of judgment um, from that sin has been dealt with by God. The gospel is not something that you graduate from. It's not something that you ever move on from. The gospel is central. We're constantly prone to forget the gospel. We're prone to forget uh, who he is, who we're not, what he did for us. Preaching the gospel all the time, every week, means that from Genesis to Revelation, you realize the whole Bible is one unfolding story of God's love and saving grace and mercy towards sinners in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that the whole Bible is about Him. And Luke records for us that Jesus taught them all the things concerning Himself from the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, which were the threefold way of describing the whole Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. Now either he was a megalomaniac or he is who he said he was and the whole Bible is about Jesus. Well I don't know about you but if I'm a follower of Jesus I want to follow Jesus understanding of the Old Testament. Therefore if we explain any text in isolation from him we fail to say the very thing that he said it's about. He said it's about him. If you're preaching about Daniel and it's dare to be a Daniel, it's not about Jesus. If you're preaching the book of Revelation and it's about Israel and Russia, then it's not about Jesus. Though Jesus isn't the content of the whole Bible, he's the center of it all. In other words, not every story, every little thing is about Jesus or can be an analogy for him, and yet it all points towards him and his work. He's the pinnacle. So the message of the Bible is that God will save his people. So any point you drop into Habakkuk or 2 Timothy, you know, any point you drop, drop into Isaiah or Deuteronomy, it's going to be connected somehow to this main trunk road of the good news of what God is doing in our world. Whether you start in Genesis 3 and you talk about God making a promise that he would crush the serpent through the seed of the woman, well, what's the rest of the book of Genesis? It's the story of that seed through the woman. And that's why so many people get bogged down by genealogies. And they're like, what are these genealogies about? This is why the New Testament opens with a genealogy and showing you that the seed has come in the person of Jesus. And so if you can't see the cross in the story of Joseph telling you what you meant for evil, God meant for good. I mean, that's the cross right there in a metaphor. Well, then you're, you're really missing the whole unity of the Bible. And I think that's probably, if you wanted to put it, what we're denying, what's one of our problems. 
is that we're missing that the Bible was written by one author and that therefore the author has a unified story that he's telling. Even though there's different human authors, they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. God is not a supporting actor in my life movie. The Bible's not about you. I have been cast as a player in his unfolding story of redemption. And we've got that reversed today. Here's what you, you'll keep infusing yourself into the stories of the Bible like you're the hero. And so a way of reading the Bible that always makes man the hero and not an, the acts of God the hero. I, I think if you mess that up, then you're reading the Bible entirely wrong because the, the Bible wants to consistently get your eyes off of you and onto a God who is able. So it's not you that are able, it's God that's able. And, and so the, I think David and Goliath, you're right, it's just a perfect story for it. Then anytime you hear the David and Goliath story, you're hearing about how you're David. In order for David to become David, he needed Saul. Stop despising Saul. You need Saul. You need people to hate on you. You need the people to tear you up. Thank God for Saul, because if you got a Saul, that makes you David. I want to be straight. I love you enough to be straight. You're not David. So I'm David and the Goliath is my debt or it's my difficult marriage or it's my boss at work. We're going to keep our distance from our enemy and sling our stones until every Goliath falls down in our life. I'm going to grab the stone of faith and I'm going to sling it at my giant of this boss at work and I'm going to slay and I'm going to hold up his head. You're going to defeat that giant. Yes, that obstacle is big, but you have greatness in you. And that would be a very narcissistic way to, to read the Bible. But in a Christ-centered hermeneutic, we're going to approach the Bible and go, okay, what's going on in this very true story? Um, it, it appears here that there's something that is terrifying and, and that on the surface it looks like it cannot be killed. And yet it, it's overcome by this man who by faith killed what couldn't be killed. And, and now we're on to a thread, right? Like, like who, what's more undefeatable than sin and death? What David was doing was enacting the justice of God on the enemies of God for the victory and salvation of God's people who did absolutely nothing but be afraid and terrified to approach the enemies of God. You know who conquers our giants? Christ conquers our giants. It's not me that conquers my giants. Like the great giant of my life, sin and death, cannot be conquered by me picking up a stone of faith and throwing it, but by the finished work of Christ who conquered death with a single shot. David was one of the men in the Bible that, that God said he was a man after my own heart. What a tremendous way of describing King David. Yet here's also a man who committed murder so that he can sleep with that man's wife. He's a murderer, he's an adulterer. Abraham, the father of our faith, we always you know, say, Abraham's a guy that lied, threw his wife under the bus, not once, but twice. I and mean, this is not a husband that you want to emulate. Do you see that the Bible takes care to tar virtually every biblical figure but one? <laughs> it's, it's almost important to remember that the Old Testament is an Eastern book more than it is a Western book. It's not just dealing linear, going A, B, C, D. Rather, who Christ is, what he must do, is being defined by what he is not in the Old Testament. And you, know, you take a figure like Samson in the Bible. You know, there was a man who had great strength and great cleverness. And uh, if you know the story, when Samson had long hair, he was strong. When he had short hair, he was weak. Now, what's the message there? Well, it's obvious we should have long hair, so then we'll be strong. Well, no, that's not the message. The message was, no matter how strong or clever you are, you are not your own savior. You are not your own redeemer. That's a dead end if you're going to depend on your own strength and your own wisdom. Think about the way a, an Eastern thinker sometimes represents truth is not saying this thought leads to that thought leads to that thought, but rather speaking around a truth so that you get the truth. The people of God are given the law, but they break the law. Sacrifices are provided, but the priests who begin to offer them become themselves malevolent and not helping. Then the judges say, well, just do what's right in your own eyes. That doesn't work. All right, pick a king. You're tall, as strong, as handsome as guy. 
well, that king becomes selfish. Well, we'll give prophets to the kings, and the kings will learn what to do from the prophets. Sounds great, except the people kill the prophets. And you begin to understand that through the course of millennia, God is saying, we need a better law keeper. We need a better judge, better sacrifice, better prophet, better priest, better king. Not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, but this. The gospel, the more we know about what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ, the great cost of our atonement, what the atonement has purchased for us, the more we understand that as Christians, the more we're going to grow in sanctification, the more we're going to grow in worship, devotion, delight in the person of God. What is the only reason that sin has any power in your life? The answer is because you love it. If the sin did not attract you, it would have no power. The reason that we sin is because we love it. And as hard as that is to hear, it's actually a wonderful understanding because it means the power over that sin is a greater love. The goal of a lecture is that you leave with information. The goal of a uh, motivational speech is that you leave with action steps. The goal of a, a gospel sermon, the goal of teaching the Bible, is that you leave worshiping. If people and churches are out of control morally, it's probably that they don't understand the gospel. What the Bible is actually teaching is that the goal of preaching is to have people profoundly, deeply love the Savior so that there is a consequence in our hearts and lives. Jesus said that in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And what makes us want to do that is a heart that loves the Savior because we've perceived how great is his love for us. Because when people are filled up with love for Christ, the love for the world is pushed out of their hearts and the power of Christ is now in their lives. So as long as we sin, unless we have a, a doctrine of sinless perfection and that you no longer sin anymore, which I think that's been known for quite some time as a heresy, then as long as you're a sinner, you need the gospel. If you sinned yesterday, then you need the gospel today. Because the gospel produces faith, and faith produces love, and love produces the fruit of good works. I think the gospel should be preached in every sermon. If I've got somebody here that I've been trying to get to here for three years, they're my next door neighbor, and the guy preaching today is just talking about the joys of motherhood, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of motherhood, but if that's all this visitor that I bring hears, that's just a shame. If your sermon could be preached in a Jewish synagogue, then it's not a Christian sermon. Foremost in my life, whenever I have a chance to preach, it, it's first of all going to be the gospel and then build upon that central message. Because if someone doesn't have a right view of the gospel, they don't have a right view about anything. So a type of reading the Bible where I'm always the hero, I'm never the Pharisee, I'm never the scared Israelites, I'm never the ones who are going to worship a golden calf just a few weeks after I was led through the Red Sea, is a misreading of Scripture that makes man the champion and not God. And it's unhealthy and it's broken and it leads to man trying to manipulate and control God like he was a genie in a lamp. We need to check ourselves and check our heart. Oftentimes, we find ourselves sitting in pews or even coming to church in order to get something from Jesus but not get Jesus himself. It is a pain to know that there are people who do not know Jesus. It is a greater pain to know that oftentimes Jesus and Christianity is being distorted. Who told you you can't accomplish your dreams? I had no clue what the gospel was. I never really heard it. You know God wants you healthy. I worked for my uncle Benny Hinn, who's a famous faith healer. As far as I knew, he died and rose again so that I could have a prosperous life. But what was going through my mind at the time was that this was real. Charlatans and snake oil salesmen have been doing this trick for decades. People think basically that religion is there to boost your ego, make you happy, make you more successful, make life go well. 
Um, and as I got older, I really started to question God and how he could send people to hell. Scripture says that we make the mistake of thinking God was like us. And what you do is you create a God who only wants to give you all the desires of your heart. Your destiny is calling out. It's time to start living large. We stayed in hotels upwards of $20,000 a night. Nobody wants to die, nobody wants to be sick, and nobody wants to be poor. All the things that Jesus says we have to be willing to set aside to follow him. They take all of those things and they make that the attraction of the gospel. We are exporting the very worst of what Christianity has to offer. I'm strong, I'm healthy, I'm blessed, I'm favored, I am a victor, not a victim. I'm gonna live a long, productive, faith-filled life. In terms of biblical Christianity, Christianity is about dying. How can I just continue to live my life as if this isn't true? So I abandoned my version of the American dream and I said, I will do what I can to take the gospel to the nations. With itching ears, I bought into this American dream motivational religion. And since it masked itself as Christianity, I thought myself to be a Christian the whole time when really it was nothing more than moralistic self-help, which is crazy to me now because I understand this is the opposite of the Christian message. We can't help ourselves. We have no hope but Christ alone. I want to talk about the impact of the documentary American Gospel. I just wanted to say how grateful and thankful I am for the American Gospel Christ Alone film. My cousin, who's a pastor up north, uh, posted via Facebook, the trailer, and I just had to see this movie. So I was so excited when I saw the trailer for the American Gospel. So I already knew it was gonna be something great just from the trailer alone. And as soon as it was available to rent, I rented it um, on Vimeo, I watched it, and I was blown away. We were blown away. Uh, as a filmmaker myself, um, in terms of production quality, I thought the film was awesome. I myself have been churched for over 30 years and have seen a lot of material and this documentary I would say is the best I've seen. It thoroughly lays out the true biblical gospel proclaiming the whole truth of God's word while pinning it against and exposing so many of the lies that are being spread in America today, lies that I bought into myself. I grew up in the prosperity word of faith movement type churches. I was one of those con artists. I was one of those businessmen. I myself bought into it many years ago and I despised the prosperity gospel. I became this very egotistical, arrogant, self-centered, selfish uh, guy and uh, everything was about me. It displaces Jesus and places in his stead an idol. And here's the reason it is so horrible. When was the last time that any American, African, Asian ever said, Jesus is all satisfying because you drove a BMW? Never. And I just thought, this guy doesn't know anything. I thought this guy was a man. This guy doesn't know anything. He's an idiot. They'll say, Jesus give you that? Yeah, well, I'll take Jesus. That's idolatry. That's not the gospel. The Jesus who's going to help me pay my taxes at the end of the year, the Jesus who's going to correct my wife's genetic disorder, I'll take that Jesus. That Jesus sounds great. But what that is is idolatry. It's an elevation of the gift above the giver. I'm so thankful for this resource because through the powerful illustrations and interviews, it kind of encapsulates my testimony in a sense. I came out of a church that taught the prosperity message and did not te teach biblical Christianity. And it's been incredibly heartbreaking to see people that I care about uh, fall into this false teaching, and it is literally everywhere where I live. 
to the idea that if you just had enough faith, bad things wouldn't happen, or you can speak things into existence, the power of positive thinking. I am young, I am beautiful, I am attractive. Remember, what follows the I am is going to come looking for you. The New Age practices that I was practicing um, as a non-believer, um, they're putting it into the church. I mean, I've had lots of family members hurt by this movement. By God's great mercy, I left the movement 29 years after I entered it. And I was able to get out of that church about 10 years ago. I was able to get out of that church and get to a biblical church. But during that time, I had to know what the word was, was saying and the difference between the real true gospel and the true Christ in the Bible and what was being taught there. And that's what this movie does. For people who are in or have been in and have made it out, it's our story. I'm actually a student at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and I attend Bethel Church in Redding, California. And Bethel Church is one of the biggest churches with the deepest involvement in the Word of Faith, Prosperity Gospel, New Apostolic Reformation sort of movement. The Word of Faith movement is the term that's given to a movement that's more commonly known as the Health and Wealth Gospel the prosperity gospel, name and claim it gospel, this teaching that it is always God's will for a Christian to be wealthy, it's always God's will for a Christian to be physically healed, we should never be sick. Believe me when I tell you, I never get sick. I was as sick as a sick dog with a, with a cold. Yeah, yeah, I get sick too. Or if we do get sick, we can be healed as long as we have enough faith we can attract positive things to ourselves through positive thinking. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor, the power of positive thinking. And the Word of Faith movement is led by people such as Benny Hinn, world's most famous faith healer, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, T.D. Jakes, Andrew Womack. These are just some of the more prominent leaders of the movement. Uh, but what has happened is that the United States of America has created this false theology and has now exported it to the rest of the world to the point that now the face of Christianity in most of the world today is Word of Faith. When they present the Word of Faith movement, they're not being harsh. They're not being harsh at all. It's being fair. It's what I believed. And from someone who is still here at Bethel, who's still at Bethel School of Ministry, I can attest to the fact that they are preaching a false gospel, that they are preaching a false Christ, and a Christ and a gospel that cannot save. The misunderstanding here is the incarnation is not simply a matter of the Spirit of God dwelling in a man or in a human being. See, Jesus was man until God touched him and put the Spirit of the living God on the inside of him. The incarnation is God himself uniting himself with human nature to become one of us. It is the union of the two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man in one person. One of the most well-known mainstream Word of Faith preachers today is Bill Johnson from Bethel Church. But one night, um, a critic of mine, who's actually now one of my friends, sent me the film American Gospel and asked me to watch it. And originally I had actually gone into watching American Gospel to completely rip it to shreds, to tear it apart, and to refute it. And so I sat and I watched this film, and by the end of this film, the Holy Spirit had taken a, like a hold of my heart to the point where I was so deeply convicted over my sin. I was so deeply grieved by the complete heresy and blasphemy of this movement that I was sick to my stomach and I didn't sleep for three nights. From that moment on, I decided that while I am here in Redding, California, while I am here at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, I am going to preach the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, in hopes that some people may repent. 
I knew after watching the film that I wanted to share it with as many family members as I could and I have, um, including sharing it with my mom who has in the last few years gone through a lot of sufferings, including the death of my um, pre-born sister. I went over and watched it with her and within the first five minutes we were both crying because my mom, I believe, got used the movie to show her that her sufferings were not meaningless and expose her to the true gospel. I just really appreciated answering the hard questions, going to the dark places, and people's testimonies of cancer. I'm not any better physically, but I am so much happier because I have Jesus and he's right here. Uh, two exciting things happen every time I share the movie with somebody and actually every time I watch it myself. The one is I, I want to give glory to God for the, for the wonder of the gospel. It both humbled me and inspired me. I really have prefaced it as something that's so beneficial no matter where you are in your walk. First of all, it was well done. Uh, we thought it was really balanced. It touched on very, very important issues that are going on in the body today. And for us, this is something we talk about frequently. And so it encouraged us about the convictions that we have and um, you know the things God is placing on our heart about the faith and truth and what matters about sound doctrine and teaching. It was just such an encouragement and such a refreshing thing to watch and challenging for me too you know to just be reminded of those essential truths and i find myself going back and listening to the first hour or so of this documentary over and over and over why because i haven't i haven't heard the gospel presented for years. The second thing that happens is I'm inspired by the clarity of the gospel and I share the gospel more as a result of watching this documentary. And the first thing I wanted to do was share it with everybody I know. Uh, they had to watch this movie. And so I have been prayerfully um, showing this to a lot of my brothers and sisters, um, many that um, that know the word and grounded, grounded in truth, and some that, you know, follow some false teachings. I've had watch parties here, a watch party here with my, with my wife, my niece, my sister. They watched it, we all watched it together, and they had questions, we had to pause it. I was taking notes, rewinding, pause, rewind, pause. What did he say? I need to get that written down. I have a, a friend that I've been trying to witness to and to disciple to, and um, she watched the film this weekend and loved it. And not only has it changed my life, but it has changed the lives of so many people that I know, and God has used this film to soften hardened hearts, to open blind eyes, to open deaf ears, and to show people who he really is. There's so many distractions in the church, and it's become about so many other things than Jesus and the work that he has done for us. I thought I was good that I just needed to work harder and, and be moral and God will help me to achieve my dreams. All the while, I didn't truly know him and serve him and I, I was hardened to the biblical gospel. But by the grace of God, through true gospel proclamation, like what's in this documentary, God opened up the eyes of my heart to see my sin against him and, and he gave me a heart to hate it and empowered me to turn from it to Christ who lived the perfect life that I could not, bore my sin and the wrath that I deserve so that by His blood I could be right with God and know Him and enjoy communion with Him forever. It's not about all this otherworldly stuff. Our eternal hope is in Christ alone. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of the pastors and the teachers and the, the people with their testimonies um, for contributing to this film. And it's just truly amazing to know what this movie is going to do. This is truly a life changer. This is a movie that every Christian in America must watch. Because if it was possible 
for God to take me, someone at Bethel Church, someone at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, if it was possible for him to take me in the midst of my deepest deception and open my eyes to the truth of, of what the gospel actually is, he can take anyone out of their deepest pit of deception if they're in this movement if they're believing in a false gospel we're looking for more uh more of this we hope that you guys get to work and bring more of this because a lot lot many many more people are going to be um uh, blessed by it so it's a great movie can't wait to see the next one can't wait to share the next one and i look forward to seeing more thank you guys for making this movie I'm concerned that people today don't know who God is. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. How does that go together? Why would you want to worship a God if you could imagine a better God? Did God kill Jesus? Yes. I don't think God killed Jesus. That's a sick God and a sick story. In fact, it even says it pleased the Father to bruise him. John MacArthur might be right about it. That's not a God worthy of my worship. It makes God the author of a terribly unjust system. This is the doctrine of Christianity. This is the doctrine that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Did Jesus go to the cross unwillingly? No. 